Half a day and good afternoon, everybody. Many of God's blessings to all of you here and to the listening audience um, here on Guam. Thank you very much. On behalf of the 35th Guam Legislature, uh, we are here uh, today to hear a presentation from our public uh, policy uh, institute interns. And before I do my spill, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues that are here with me this afternoon. Uh, uh, joining us uh, is uh, Senator uh, Will Castro. Uh, thank you so much for coming on this afternoon. I also want to put a plug in for you, uh, Senator Castro, as I know and believe in my heart that you were one of the pioneers in this program that now has become statute. Uh, way back when you were working with Speaker Wanpad and literally taking the leadership with Mr. Sharak Bawani to uh, give a venue for uh, interns to come and get uh, hands-on training uh, of what we do in the legislature. So I wanna thank you uh, for your leadership and continuing to be a part of that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we also have um, Director Teresa Ariola and Dr. Nasizuas Masi for being here and being, uh, representing the government of Guam, but more importantly, your agency with behavioral health. Uh, uh, our students, our interns felt that it was very important to, to work closely with Guam Behavioral Health. And I want to thank you for your support and your efforts in working closely with our interns. And I just want to thank everyone for their attendance today to witness the excellent work of the Public Policy Institute interns uh, that my office has guided. Uh, the interns uh, will be speaking about the Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center Crisis Hotline and storm drain concerns and possible solutions for our island. Now, before the interns begin, I would like to express how proud I am of all of you for your diligent work, your professional uh, manner and your willingness to learn. You are all very, very bright, and we are very excited to, to hear what you have prepared for us. And uh, before I have them go, and I'd also be remiss if I didn't take the time to thank uh, the, the staff in my office, uh, especially with uh, Chirac, Allen, Amanda, Taylor, just everybody in the TMB office, the speaker's office to help drive this, and also uh, uh, a professor from the university who took his time to work closely with the Public Policy Institute, uh, uh, Institute interns, uh, Dr. James G. And I just want to say uh, thank you and maybe yield the floor over to you uh, to say a few words before we have the interns start. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Um, my name is James G. I'm the advisor for the 2020 PPI uh, interns. Um, I've also, I also share speaker sentiments in thanking the interns for their hard work, their commitment. Um, they're truly the future leaders and they really were motivated with this project um, and they really pushed hard trying to help the community. Um, so with that being said, um, great job and good luck. Thank you very much, Jimmy. I also want to acknowledge the presence of Senator Regine Bisco Lee, who's got oversight chair of the Committee of Rules and Dunklu Nasidzus Masi for being here and, and listening to uh, the great work our interns have done, Sidzus Masi. At this time, um, interns, you have the floor. Thank you, Speaker. Half a day and good morning. We are the Public Policy Institute under the guidance of Speaker Tina Munya Barnes. My name is Sojung Ann and I'm currently a senior at Harvest Christian Academy. My name is Chelsea Luo and I'm currently a senior at St. John's School. My name is Isla Rodriguez. I graduated from JFK in 2019 and I'm currently a sophomore at Brown University. My name is Mark Wang and I'm currently a sophomore at St. John's. So when we first started off our policy project, we brainstormed ideas from developing the film office, looking into ways to boost our economy by helping tourism, research into the Jones Act, and even try to research other economic investments such as agriculture and aquaculture. But we all came to a consensus, wanting to take initiative to help our community during this pandemic as soon as possible, especially when anxiety and the fear is high. With one simple suggestion from Isla, we decided to do something mental health related. 
Even with the settlement of mental health, we differ from topics ranging from helping our youths to researching into social work and even help fund a mobile crisis response team. We ultimately decided to help the Guam Crisis Hotline, which was advised by the Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center. With September being the World Suicide Prevention Month, the Public Policy Institute decided to work on an appropriations bill throughout July to, the, to September to fund the Guam Crisis Hotline at the Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center. We know due to COVID-19 that the Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center had a huge increase in crisis calls, but they did not have the proper employees established to answer these calls. So we wanted a way to find, uh, we wanted to find a way to help them out. Um, Mark, you can proceed. Our objective for this bill and this policy project was, of course, to fund the Guam Crisis Hotline so that they are able to attain around 11 dedicated full-time employees to only man the crisis calls. With these 11 FTEs, they would receive an average salary of $40,196 that includes their base salary along with additional benefits. The reason why GBHWC needs at least 11 FTEs is because they need a minimum of two employees manning the crisis hotline during each shift throughout the day. One of the employees has to be on the call with the person the whole time while the other employee dispatches 911 if it is needed. You can, um, yeah. You can proceed. Before I continue, I'd like to give a fair warning. The next multiple slides will be addressing mentions of suicide. So if you are sensitive to this topic, please feel free to take a break from this discussion. With that being said, the upcoming graph will include an age-adjusted suicide rate and a crude suicide rate. An age-adjusted suicide rate means the weighted average of age-specific rate, which makes a fair comparison between groups of different age distributions. The crude rate is the total number of suicides divided by the population. So according to the 2019 Guam State Epidemiological Outcome Works Group report, our age-adjusted suicide rate is significantly higher than the U.S. mainland's age-adjusted rate. During 2016, Guam's age-adjusted rate was 36.6 per 100,000, while the U.S. age-adjusted rate was 13.5 per 100,000. During 2018, Guam's age-adjusted rate was 31.3 per 100,000, while the U.S. age-adjusted rate is 14.2 per 100,000. These numbers alone show how drastic our suicide rates are compared to the U.S. Proceed. This graph contains the age-adjusted suicide rates and the crude suicide rates for Guam from 2009 to 2019, compared to the U.S.'s age-adjusted suicide rates. From 2009 to 2015, we had an approximate slow increase in our suicide rates, but during 2016, we heavily spiked in our rates. Although we have declined and decreased our suicide rates from 2016, we still want to help lower those numbers even more and make sure we don't lose any of our citizens to suicide. The next following two slides and sets of data have been taken from the Guam Post latest ar article regarding suicide rates. Proceed. This graph shows the updated statistics from 2016 to 2020 of August. We have amassed around a total of 26 suicide deaths, deaths from only January through August of this year. Proceed. In this graph, we show the number of suicides that has happened from only 2020 alone from January to August. For three consecutive months of June, July, and August, we have accumulated 15 suicide deaths from only the past three months, resulting in one suicide death per every six days. In comparison, the same three months from last year, there were only six suicide deaths. During those months, the suicide deaths in 2020 are more than double the amount we had last year, which is extremely, extremely alarming. From these slides alone, it shows the greater need for suicide prevention to be implemented into our island, especially during a time like this. With that being said, I would like to pass it on to Isla to elaborate more on these suicide statistics. Thank you, Sojong. And before I proceed, as a courtesy, I do want to share that some of the information I'll be presenting about the sites and methods of suicide may be sensitive and a trigger to some people, so please proceed with caution. Uh, proceed, please. Next slide. So most suicides in our island happen at home, 64% to be exact, followed by 15% at public places and 2% at work. 
this is a huge concern as due to the pandemic, more people are staying home. They may feel isolated from the world and they may have even lost touch with their friends and loved ones and have lost their jobs. That is why during these challenging times especially, it is imperative that we have adequate resources in our island to support our people with their physical and mental health. Next slide, please. As most suicides do occur at home, hanging is the predominant method of choice at 80%, followed by gunshots at 10% and jumping at 4%. Next slide. Unfortunately, suicide is not the only issue that is prominent in our island. Although we don't usually talk about it due to the stigma that surrounds it, substance abuse and mental illnesses do exist and they do contribute to the increasing number of people that will lose to suicide every year. From 2009 to 2019, data shows that 15% of suicide involved alcohol use and 5% involved the use of drugs. Meanwhile, 11% had a history of previous mental illness and another 11% had made a previous suicidal attempt. What this statistics tells us is that there were people out there who couldn't get the help that they needed to feel better, leading them to attempt suicide not once but multiple times and which ultimately they lost their lives. Oh, next slide. Now from this graph here, we can see that those who committed suicide are mostly younger people. 14% were 10 to 19 year olds, 36% 20 to 29 year olds, and 24%, 30, wait, sorry, 36% were 20 to 29 year olds, and 24% are 30 to 39 year olds. What is also concerning is that depression and feelings of hopelessness are increasingly becoming more common in teens and young adults, as data actually shows that as high as 40% of bombs youth experience these symptoms. Next slide. Now you might be wondering, is this an issue that needs our needed attention? While well, suicide is the eighth leading cause of death here in our island. Moreover, the situation has only gotten worse as a recent article from the Guam Daily Post, as Sojung had mentioned, mentioned that we lose one person to suicide every six days. And this is in the last three months alone. When you compare this to the national statistics that you see on the right, we can do more to improve Guam's behavioral health services and hopefully by doing so, we can significantly decrease the number of people that we lose to suicide every year. Now, I'd like to pass it on to Chelsea to talk specifically about Guam Behavioral Health's Crisis Hotline. Thank you, Isla. So I will be elaborating on Guam's Crisis Hotline. So Guam has a local crisis hotline, which is managed by Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center. And with the current pandemic, the hotline is seeing a dramatic increase in the number of calls they're receiving. So they're starting to see more and more people who need mental health support because the pandemic is, is actually exacerbating their mental health conditions. And a lot of people are calling because of increased anxiety or fears of contracting the virus or because of the effects of the prolonged isolation. A lot of people are unemployed, um, they're struggling and things may not be so good at home. Uh, other people are calling because of COVID symptoms, financial concerns, suicidal ideation and so on. And since the start of the pandemic, there has been consistently 100 calls per week and roughly 320 calls per month. And in the period between March 16 and April 25, which was the start of the pandemic, there have been 609 phone calls to the crisis hotline. And the most current data we have, which we received from Guam Behavioral Health, shows that there have been a total of 1,911 calls from March 18 to July, to July 12. And that's just up to July 12. So I would think by now we would have more than 2,000 total calls. Next slide, please. I can add to that later. All right. So the problem with the crisis hotline is they only have one full-time staff to manage the no large number of calls. And that staff is underfunded and quite frankly understaffed. So it's social workers, physicians, and counselors who comprise the local hotline staff. And they have other duties on top of answering these phones. Um, and they were hired specifically for other functions. Guam Behavioral Health doesn't actually hire anybody to be a crisis hotline dispatcher. And of course, hotline workers have to call back and do a follow-up with the patient, so they're not just answering calls. So in order to combat this huge increase in the number of people seeking help, Guam Behavioral Health actually set up a Facebook page for those with Facebook accounts. And I believe they have a group chat where they can host virtual meetings. But when you're suicidal or unstable, sometimes you just want to talk to someone 
uh, privately over the phone, right? So our bill would, uh, our proposal would allow for the hiring of at least 11 full-time employees, as Sojung mentioned, to man the hotlines, and that would be their only job. Next slide, please. Okay, so then the Guam Crisis Lifeline is the national hotline that is in the States. Um, so during the last six months of 2019, 167 of Guam's residents called the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is a 1-800 number, I believe. So their call went to a hotline operator in the States, um, but 0% of these callers received help. And those calls couldn't be redirected to Guam Behavioral Health because we don't have an established national crisis lifeline. So Guam's hotline workers couldn't help the 167 people who called. And this is an issue because if someone from Guam is calling a crisis hotline, we want it to be our crisis hotline because how can hotline operators in the States understand the situation here? And they can't really relate to us. And some of, the, some of them may not even know where Guam is. So we wanna have a local operator to assist callers with their concerns. And from our meeting with the director of Guam Behavioral Health, what I gathered is that they have already applied to the National Crisis Lifeline. So they're currently in their last phase, which is the training phase. Um, the funds appropriated from our bill would improve our local hotline to make sure that calls redirected from the National Crisis Lifeline, when it is fully established, can be answered and assisted more effectively. Next slide, please. So on the left are the calls accumulated over the years and on the right are the calls from specific months in 2019. Um, the blue represents those who are calling the national hotline and the green represents those who are calling the local crisis hotline. And as you can see, there's no green, which means that those calls are not being redirected to Guam's crisis hotline operators. Um, they're going straight to the states. Um, so the people who called are unable to receive help because operators in the states may be busy with callers from their states and those Guam calls cannot be redirected to our local crisis call center since we don't have an established national hotline yet. So our bill would improve on the local crisis hotline to fulfill the needs of local residents to ensure that they're helped and their calls don't go unanswered. And I just wanna stress that um, we needed this funding even before the pandemic. Um, so now we need it even more and mental health really should be as much of a priority as physical health. So. I implore you to please consider all the benefits of our proposal. Next slide. So uh, to really summarize uh, some of Guam Behavioral Health's challenges right now, and this is a, coming from the Citizen Centric Report, uh, most challenges include lack of funding, uh, the recruitment and retention of qualified staff, uh, requisition and procurement delays, the need for capital improvement projects, an anticipated critical, sh an anticipated shortage of qualified medical uh, prof uh, professionals due to uh, in, in, in the anticipation of require, uh, retirement and an aging medical workforce. So with all that being said, as of August 30th, 2020, the Consolidated Revenue Expenditure Report indicates a projected overage of $429,155,000 in the Healthy Futures Fund balance. And this bill would appropriate $400,000 of those from the Healthy Futures Fund to the Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center. With that being said, let's do our part as policy writers and public servants to help Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center make sure that no call goes unnoticed. Because when our people have the courage to call our local lifelines, the least we can do is answer their calls listen to them and cater to their needs by giving them proper assistance. Throughout this project, I was very passionate about helping those on our island, specifically on this topic, because at my school, a friend and I were able to establish a mental health awareness club to acknowledge, educate, and empower those who are struggling with mental health. Through this club, I've seen multiple stu students reaching out to talk about their struggles, and the least I could do for them was listen to them and try to help them as well. No one should feel alone because everyone's life is precious and valuable and we should do what it takes to make sure we don't lose another one of our citizens and our people. Because one missed call might lead to someone's whole life being changed. Thank you so much for your time and we hope our policy project is able to aid our community. With that being said, are there any questions or concerns?
Um, I'm not sure if this is the time, Speaker, um, or it, it, would this be the time to? I, uh, at this time, I'm just going to divert from the presentation, Director Ariola. I know your time is very valuable. I'll go ahead. Don't worry. And... This is. <laughs> don't worry about it. Uh, the nice thing about it is the four o'clock Zoom is my last Zoom for the day. So. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much. Um, we but do have another presentation, and I do know that I have a couple of my colleagues on, and uh, uh, I will at this time, uh, just to keep it fresh, to go ahead and direct to you, Director uh, Ariola, oh. to share okay. uh, your, your comments or questions for the team right now. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to the interns that... Um, they did visit me, and uh, I know they spoke to other folks at the Guam Behavioral Health. And uh, I just want to give a little bit of an update. Um, the latest number of calls to the crisis hotline is 2,945, and that is as of August 31st. That is a rolling average of 520, 500 some, 520, 530 calls a month in comparison to 25 to 30 calls a month prior to COVID. Um, one thing that COVID has done, it has fast-tracked our ability to get our crisis number 6478833 out there in the community. Uh, we were able to um, uh, obtain uh, COVID mental health emergency funding, and we have used that funding to do a lot of media outreach. And so, um, we're, we're very active in social media and uh, media outreach. And that's probably the reason why more and more people are starting to call, which is always a good thing. The first thing they need to know is who, where to call. And then, and so we are inundated with, uh, with callers, uh, but that's a good thing for us because that's what we're here to do. Um, several indicators because of the increase of calls is that number one, that our number is being known more. Number two, that the stigma of reaching out and getting help um, is reducing. And so um, I, 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 I'm very excited of the presentation you put together. So I just wanted to update that 2,945 calls um, as of August 31st. So your 300 calls a month average is now pushed up to 500 some calls a month. Now, with regards to the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, that's a completely different hotline, 1-800 number. And because Guam has not yet established a Guam uh, Suicide Prevention Hotline per se, that's what the interns had mentioned, that one that calls from the 671 area code were redirected to the main national hot prevention hotline. And how that normally works is, is uh, they will take get the, the person on the national crisis hotline will address no matter what area code you're calling from for immediate assistance. But really it's about the follow-up and they should be able to redirect that call to the local jurisdiction, the 671. And because Guam Behavioral Health has yet to establish a Guam uh, suicide prevention hotline, uh, those calls were not uh, transferred over. So since I've been the director of Guam Behavioral Health, that was another priority. And so our application is three phase and we submitted that application we're in our third phase. And I was, as I was sharing to Senator Lamarena on K57, um, that, uh, that call, suicide is of course, one of the reasons why people call our crisis hotline. So you have a crisis, we have the established Guam Behavioral Health crisis hotline, any crisis, suicide, depression, anxiety, um, anybody calls that. But the suicide national hotline is specific for suicide. And so when I first came, when I got in, we realized that how are, how are we going to connect the dots and really help these people 
these hundreds some people that actually called because of suicide, a 1-800 number, and yet I'm not able to help them in the local jurisdiction. So our application is in, and I'm happy to say that we're waiting for, for um, our last phase. We are confident that that is going to happen. And when that happens, it's going to be a wonderful thing because what's going to happen is that we are going to be able to build up the infrastructure of, of our crisis unit that I want to establish at the department. That will include the general crisis hotline number, the, the local suicide prevention number, our mobile response team, which we do have one mobile response team on Guam that's initiated by Guam Behavioral Health and just dedicated staff. And so as the interns had mentioned, Guam Behavioral Health doesn't have a position. Um, we don't have positions to answer the crisis hotline. What has happened in the past is that the crisis hotline has been answered by the nurses stationed in the units. And because the units have become more and more busy, it is not conducive to proper answering of the crisis hotline. So what I have done is I've redirected resources so that we actually have a crisis hotline team. Now that's fine and dandy now because certain services at the department is modified because of COVID. But what's gonna happen when everything goes back to normal, whether it's next year or two years from now, and everybody has to go back to doing the 100% the of the services that they were hired to do. So hiring specific employees just to man the crisis hotline unit is something that we really need to think about in the very near future. I don't, I predict that because of all the uh, advertisement and the media and the funding that we've received to pump up and to let our residents know about the crisis hotline number, that uh, the average will never go back to 25 a month, 25 to 30 a month. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is if they know the number, people will keep calling it. Whether today it might be depression, tomorrow it might be I'm worried about my finances. So there is definitely a need to establish more permanent FTEs, full-time employees, to, to uh, run the crisis hotline. And at this point... Um, I know that the presentation asked for 11, but I would just be happy if we would just have even half of that. But um, I just want to say thank you because highlighting the crisis hotline and how it answers the call to uh, those who are thinking of suicide and just not just suicide, but just those an avenue, a venue in which, um, a medium in which people can seek help is really an important um, uh, part of how Guam Behavioral Health responds to our, for, to our island. So thank you very much for the hard work of the internship and thank you, Madam Speaker, for uh, introducing me to them. Jules Mossy, Director Ariel, and at its time, I know that my colleagues, Regine, Senator Regine Bissi, He's online. Um, I yield the floor to you for any questions or comments. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and I want to echo Director Ariola's uh, comments. I'm so grateful to PPI, um, to each of the students who participated in this um, presentation. It was very thorough. I, you know, I feel like I know a lot about behavioral health and I know a lot about um, you know some of the suicide work that we do on Guam but I, I learned I learned some new things today especially about our current situation uh, with regard to COVID. Um, so I definitely want to thank PPI. I want to thank behavioral health uh, director Ariola and their deputy uh, Carissa Pangolinan. Um, this topic is very personal to me. I um, when I was living in the States we had a very close friend uh, lose his life to suicide. Um, and, you know, my husband is a frontliner. He has to 
deal with several of the calls locally, um, responding to people who are, you know, at, at the end of their rope and, and, and really reaching out for help. And so I'm so grateful um, again to PPI for bringing this to our attention once again. Um, I think especially, it's just very timely uh, with the article that recently came out about, you know, just calling attention to this issue. Um, there are a lot of things that are currently being done, especially with regard to our youth. Um, the director um, has teamed up with Department of Education to have a youth mental health first aid program that we were able to push forward um, in this term. I'm really glad that we were able to do that work. And I'm really grateful that we're, um, as the director had mentioned, at the third phase of our application for the national hotline, because right. I think it really gives um, our community just a sense of a good sense of knowing that if they have the courage to make that call, that somebody here on island yeah. is going to answer. And, and that can make a world of difference just to help turn somebody's life around. And so I'm so appreciative of your time, of your, of your work, and your, your really big hearts to consider, you know, all of the hurt and the pain and the anxiety that's going through um, so many of our hearts and minds right now in our community. Thank you for presenting the issue, the problem, but also presenting a very clear solution and a pathway for us to address it. So, Sudos Masi, thank you, Speaker, and thank you, PPI. Buen uh, Pogetsu, Senator uh, Lee, uh, for, the, for, for your comments. Uh, very, very... Uh, inspirational for the, and and I think that uh, director Ariola will agree with me in in your efforts to knowing that these interns not only looked at a, a, a critical issue uh, uh, presented their, their their findings and their facts and also ha have a, a solution for it so thank you um, Senator will Castro I will acknowledge you at this time you have the floor Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you, Senator Lee, for that insight. And special thanks to the interns. Um, thank you, Director Ariola, as well. So uh, maybe I can provide my feedback. First of all, the policy perspective is, uh, as my colleague mentioned, is both timely and, and so critical. Uh, I want to share my thoughts as a teacher and as uh, someone on the ground level with PPI under the uh, former speaker. And at the time, Speaker, if I'm not mistaken, you were the legislative secretary and a strong proponent of this. And you could see it's taken on a new life, a new iteration. And I could tell you right now with her leadership and the support of her colleagues, it's really grown beyond just the uh, academic exercise of researching a topic and applying it to a real world situation. By having the administration uh, intimately involved with this, it shows that we're at the next possible level of a meaningful policy recommendation. So I was thoroughly impressed with your analysis and uh, the citation of uh, your research. I was thoroughly impressed with the level of maturity and the delivery of the material, again, speaking as a teacher. Uh, and I thank you for that. Uh, the world is watching you. This is a recording and I'm pretty sure it'll be posted on the legislative website. So you are uh, models for aspiring scholars and policy wonks, if you will. And so it's a wonderful uh, leadership imprint that you left upon the minds and, and the hearts of many. So thank you for touching on an important topic and contributing in a meaningful way to this policy discussion. I wish you all the best and I'm so grateful that you had good mentorship under the speaker and Sharag and, and uh, Teresa Ariola. I've known her of her for many years. I know her husband more and she's no nonsense and she's a doer. So stick close to the chief if you need her, the uh, director rather, forgive me and I'm sure you're gonna get much farther faster. So thank you all, thank you speaker, thank you to the administration and Therese, and thank you Sharag for being the first on the ground level, the first student to come out of this, first leader, and look at you now, you're replicating your success. And that's, that's the best form of teaching and legacy uh, building that we can ever see in our lives, someone passing on the gifts and, and the training. So thank you everybody. I just wanna say that I think I wanna refund Mr. Castro, they did a better job than we did <laughs> you know what let me tell you uh speaker i know this is colloquial sorry this is live but an old man once told me shirag that the copy can never be better than the original so you keep that in mind you're a fine example for the world to follow uh thank you senator castro um colleagues we
We are still not done with the presentation. We do have uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Sangjo Sunny Kang to do his presentation on Guam's storm drains. And at this time, if you can just allow me the opportunity to give uh, Mr. Sunny the floor now to do his presentation. Madam Speaker, if, if, if I can just uh, be excused, I, I just um, thank you so much. I look forward to the next steps. And I want to thank uh, the senators who took their time, yourself, Senator Lee, and Senator uh, Will Castro for being here. Um, uh, I just want to say that uh, I'm very pleased. I'm glad that their people are starting to make the connection between the need of having the infrastructure of a crisis hotline fully manned. Sometimes when people think of uh, employees for a line, really, do you need that, Therese? Why can't you just move people around? But um, that can only, that works, that only works for a little bit. And then if you really want true investment, then you just need to make the true investment. And so I just want to say that it's not that we didn't, we, we actually have a contingency plan. I put in an application for a $4 million application and we called it Ogang, you know, to call Ogang, Ogang line. It's a SAMHSA grant. And if all of, if everything works out, I'm not going to need people's money. I'm just going to have the federal dollars to, to stand this up. So there is a backup plan. And, uh, but we're, we're tracking that grant, a $4 million grant to stand up the crisis unit that will, uh, but, you know, with COVID everything, even the grant system, uh, awarding system has been delayed. So just want you to know that uh, there's several layers of trying to figure out how to fund this. But I, I do appreciate uh, your efforts um, and, um, and thank you. And I hope everybody has a very safe weekend. Please, um, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that we are on lockdown, but I'd rather be on lockdown and, and, and healthy and be able to see your faces than not. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Director Ariola. God thank bless you. you. God bless you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sunny Kang, uh, I will now address you to do your presentation on the floor. Thank you. Just a moment, I'll just get my screen shared. Okay. I'll just, I'll start now. Hello, I'm Sun Ho Kang, and I'm going to present about uh, the solutions for Guam's storm drains. The reason why I came up with this uh, storm drain design is that when I first visited Guam a few years ago, Guam was a beautiful, fantastic, and perfect island full of fun and interesting things. So my family was fascinated by Guam and and visited Guam several times a year since then, and Guam's beauty is what we should maintain. Later, I moved uh, from Guam to South Korea in 2018. And after moving to Guam as a resident, I encountered some inconveniences. Many of them were related to water and the environment, such as hard water, low water pressure, etc. Et However, I think that flooding is the most serious problem among all of these because not only does it give inconvenience, but it also could deal costly damages. These floodings can also, uh, also give destructions and cause flash floods, which could also take lives. Some mayors also state that debris can also cause floods. The problems with, there are so certain problems with our current drainage water system, which is over flooding and animals like frogs and other animals could get stuck in the sewage system, which, cre which could create clogging and smell. And also garbage and debris in the sewage system are unfiltered and sent to the ocean, which could kill, uh, potentially kill coral and wildlife. 
examples from there are certain examples from uh, South Korea that they did for their uh, systems. Uh, according to South Korean law, if people litter in public places, it comes with a 50,000 won, which is equivalent to $42 of fine. It's usually for sewers and storm drains because uh, people tend to litter there. And people in South Korea also can also report for public littering in certain applications, such as the mobile app created by the Ministry of Public Administration and Security. They, could al they also go over me more measures to protect the sewer system, like banning the use of garbage disposal in, in, sinks, in sinks, because it can also potentially clog the sewers. What we can do is we could create a pilot program of a new and improved stormwater drainage with a simple filtration. And we could also create a pilot program to develop an app like South Korea, which we could design an app and release it so that people, people can report the app rather than other, using other social media. And I have actually come up with a design of these storm drains. Uh, an improved design of the traditional sewer drainage system on the streets could help solve or flooding and sewage backups. My proposed design will help with the overall efficiency of the drainage system, and it could fix over flooding on the streets and benefit the ocean ecosystem. So, what the how the design works is the plate. There are plates on the on these holes, and it's held by the tension of the spring mounted, which is, which prevents other substances like like. Uh, litters from entering. And however, when water is collected due to heavy rain, it not only it seeps through the these gaps, but also the weight of the water could also push these plates down, which creates a uh, space where water could easily seep through. And implementation, if implemented, it, it would be the new storm drain design will be implemented in, on parts of the main roads first, which is Marine Corps Drive and Palace San Vittorio's Road, where this ground is low and it's easy to be flooded. It's also one of the important roads that should not be flooded. So we, we need these designs to prevent floodings in these areas. It, could, it would be also implemented gradually from Hagania to the surrounding regions. Doing this will also give the new sewage system some time to be tested in reality. And fundings and costs, uh, production costs are estimated by around $100 to $300 per uh, sewage, uh, sorry, uh, per uh, storm drain. And also any, there could be uh, public-private partnerships, or maybe with GSWA. Implementation costs uh, would also need to be considered. And since it's hard to make make these designs in Guam, we could also play, find a place where logistics and production costs are the cheapest, like China and South Korea. Are there any questions on these, on this presentation? Thank you uh, very much, Sunny, uh, for your presentation, but I want to take this time right now to thank you, Sunny, Sojong, um, Isla, Mark, and Chelsea for uh, your presentation. I, again, I must say that I'm very, very proud, very Vanadosa of all the work that you guys have done. Um, I know that um, there were many things that you guys had to do to juggle in the past few months and especially during the time of uh, COVID. And I commend all of you for staying the course and working as a team to get this work done. And um, um, as we turn it over to my colleagues, I just want to say to you, Sonny, uh, based on your presentation and and the device uh, that you have, the first question I'd like to ask is, do you, you, I see the graphics and I see what was drawn, the configuration that's here on paper, but do you have a sample of what could be utilized for the storm drains here on our island of Guam? Can I see your face? Of course. Uh, yes, I do have have the sample. Should I just unshare this and you know show you? take us off the grid, uh, Chirac, and so that we can see all the participants at this time now.
There you are, Sunny. This is what I uh, built. Sorry. Here. Yeah. So, so these are plates that could um, be lowered, and see you can see there are holes here, which could be also uh, more room for water to seep through. So it, it it would it literally the 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 plate will also keep the trash from 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 entering into the storm drain. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. At this time, I yield to Senator Regine Biscoli. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Sunny, so much for your presentation. Um, I'm not sure if you, uh, during your research, were aware that there was actually several millions of dollars uh, set aside in our hotel occupancy tax bond to attempt to address this problem in Tumon, because you're right, it's been it's been a really big problem, and I, I, I really appreciated how your presentation took it a step further to not just identify um, the issue, but also to tell you how it kind of um, further affects our environment and how, you know, we have runoff issues and it can, you know, kill coral and um, further affect not just our environment, but, you know, our tourism industry and, and just not having these beautiful natural resources available to our community because, you know, we haven't, we haven't taken good care of the problem. I wanted to ask you, Sunny, are you aware of, um, do you know who Mayor Pete Buttigieg is? He was a presidential candidate. He ran for president, but he was the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Are you familiar yes. with Yes, yes, I do. Uh, I do know him. Yeah. Yeah. So it was interesting because he implemented um, smart sewers in South Bend, Indiana, and it's my understanding that he was able to pair up with some coders from um, his jurisdiction to try to come up with some solutions to, I guess, migrate these sewer systems into the cloud. And I get it, the ripple effect was, you know, it, it provided their city with over a hundred million dollars in savings um, that they would have spent on new pipes. Uh, because they were able to address this problem utilizing technology um, in, a, in a new and innovative way. And so I think that that's something that you have shown us. I really love your prototype and I'd love to be able to take a look at it. I'm not sure if you're able to bring it down to the speaker's office so we can kind of um, take a look at it and kind of, you know, uh, it's, I'm a tactile person so I kind of want to to see, but I, I'm really interested in learning more, and I just appreciate uh, the time and the research that you that you took to be able to take something that everybody complains about day in and day out, but to actually again bring a solution. I'm very impressed. Thank you, Sunny, and thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Lee. Senator Will Castro, you recognize it this time. Just want to thank you for your contribution to the discussion. Uh, it's a long-standing issue throughout the island, and my colleague referred to stormwater drainage and other things in terms of, um, you know, the issues facing the environment. So thank you again. It's a it's not an easy topic to address, but obviously you demonstrated a level of academic and intellectual maturity, and I appreciate that. And um, I'll be sure to look this over with the policy team and see how we can carry on from there. I remember these active discussions during the Calvo administration. Uh, in a number of number of contexts, and so I'm sure your contribution will help us a lot. Thank you Thank again. You. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Senator Castro. And I know uh, Senator Regine just sent me a message on how much uh, uh, Peter uh, Pete uh, Buttigieg was able to save in uh, South Indiana. Did you want to share that? That was that was a lot of money that they were able to save, and and I think. I think knowing that, that the interns uh, today, colleagues, uh, had a critical uh, presentation to share with us 
had uh, done their presentation, but also came up with the solutions and something that we can take further for them is bringing uh, uh, what they brought to this table even further and seeing how we can partner with the government entities uh, that, that need to be involved in. And it's also a blessing to hear that um, that even as, as the uh, interns made the recommendations to utilize the uh, the the funds uh, in the healthy future funds that 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 the the director Ariola was taking it a step further to look for funds there and if that could be utilized if we could receive those federal grants uh, hopefully uh, sooner than later then 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 we could also take that funding source and use it for even uh, more critical stuff with, with the uh, Guam Behavioral Health Center. And I just want to say that this is excellent work. And I this is what the institution uh, was created. I, I have to thank uh, the, the advisor this year, um, um, James G for, for his efforts and, and staying close with the students. Also to the interns for, for literally uh, staying on course uh, to my office. Um, you guys have been um, great uh, stewards in making sure that 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 this program uh, continues to get its hundred percent support. Uh, making sure that uh, this presentation to be viewed for for the public and for the for the whole island of Guam that that it's presented with uh, great success. But our job is as colleagues to Senator Lee and Senator Castro is to follow through. And, and when we follow through, the hard work that the interns have done become great successes. So I think that's our job. Our job is to make sure that we facilitate it and, and follow through for them and give them the update uh, because this, this, is, this was their part-time job for the island of Guam was they stepped up to the plate to continue their, they weren't volunteer, they were volunteered, they volunteered to be a part of this program and to give up their time, their personal time to do this for the island of Guam. So I know that, that we are all proud of them uh, uh, for the success that they've done in today's presentation. And I know that if we follow through for them and, and truly implement the programs that they have, I think uh, that they will continue to, to exemplify the leadership that they've done so today. So with that being said, um, if there, uh, I want to yield it right now to the advisor, Mr. G, to see if you have any other comments uh, or any closing remarks uh, for the interns before I turn it over to my colleagues and to my staff. Thank you, Speaker. I just want to thank everyone for being here, Senators Lee and Senator Castro, um, also the staff of the Speaker, um, his office, Shirag, Alan, Amanda, and also especially the interns. You guys were amazing. Um, I share in everyone's sentiments. You guys did a great job. You made my advising really easy. You guys were, you guys stay motivated through this difficult situation. And I just want to thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Lee, any closing remarks for the interns? Just trying to find my unmute button. I'm just really thoroughly impressed and um, I'm really very motivated and hopeful that we're able to take what you've presented today and, and move forward with it. So I just really wanna thank you. Um, and I know that the speaker and Senator Castro will probably agree with me. If anybody needs uh, letters of recommendation for scholarships or anything that you pursue in the future, um, we've seen the evidence of your work and, and I wanna extend that to all of you. I'm very, very grateful for just, again, presenting us with the problem, but also, you know, multiple solutions that we can consider uh, to move forward. Thank you so much, Sudos Masi. Gwen Provetsu, uh, Senator Lee, for the inspiration and, and for your kind words. Senator Castro, you are recognized. You know, I tell you, um, I failed to recognize uh, perhaps the backbone of this group in terms of uh, the senior advisement, Dr. G, thank you. We all know Sharag's role as the main um, 
operative or staffer to this and he's invaluable and we always give him his strokes okay so we give him his accolades but uh it's it's uh, folks like you dr g who step up to uh, bring added value to the discussion and to guide these young minds i wish i could do it i'm looking forward to going back to the classroom uh when when god uh permits me to uh, I have a partner, Dr. Deborah Tadella Career, my fiance, who teaches full time. And so I, I live vicariously through her. But thank you, Speaker, for giving permanent life to this program. And uh, Senator Lee, the chair on rules, tremendous advocate and ally. And so all you young minds who benefited from this, you remember your island and your people and remember this community and how much they, they embraced you and nurtured your growth. And I thank you again. God bless you on your journey. And when you, when you, uh, as Mr. Forbes used to say at FD, you know, when you make it big, run me over with your Rolls Royce. And don't think about the money. I just do have to share the old FD adages. But when you make it in your life, whatever that may be, please has to hit. Remember us here. God bless you all. Thank you, Senator Castro. And and for me, uh, to the Public uh, Policy Institute team on Dunkel and Asizus Mossy for all your hard work. And I, I just know that uh, it is programs like this that will continue to bring future leaders and make our beautiful island of Guam a better place to live in. And I just want to say that your hard work and, and your success in the future will go very, very far. You've taken that time, you've made the sacrifices, you have brought the solutions to the table and uh, it's almost graduation time for you. And I want to extend our apologies uh, on behalf of the 35th Guam legislature that there could, there probably might not be, it just depends on when we get off uh, PCOR one, but we know that a graduation is being worked on right now uh, with the policy team uh, and the staff and working closely with uh, Senator Lee uh, and Senator Castro on a time because uh, we, too, uh, in the legislature have to abide by the risk assessments and making sure that our community and, of course, our, our facility and our employees are safe. So um, congratulations uh, in advance uh, for all your hard work. And, and senators, I, I want to say for the record and to the people of Guam that these interns today uh, deserve the highest respect and accolades for all that they've done. And uh, they have completed their hours of distinction. They have, uh, I, I think all of them have put in uh, more than their time. And I'm hoping that with that, when we set for, for the graduation ceremony, that uh, the, their recognition will also be uh, noted there. So thank you in advance, Senator uh, Lee and Senator Castro for your support. And, making sure that the graduation for them that is slated for sometime in, in September that we make it for them. And hopefully we'll be out of PCOR 2, I mean PCOR 1. And if not, then we'll, we'll think of something creative because they truly deserve uh, the, uh, the accolades for doing such a successful job. Thank you. And, and to my staff again, on Dunkel Nasitos Masi, I always say behind a good leader is a great staff and and a great team and, and this team has gone way beyond to help uh, make this happen. And we hope that the interns can share and spread um, the opportunity right. and the learning and the experience that they've had this year, even during the most trying times and come out and have come out successfully. And hopefully we can grow and make this institute an even bigger, better, and hopefully that the interns will be able to, uh, based on the grants that we are fighting for and applying for, that hopefully the interns will be in the future could get some, some kind of stipend to help them out in their efforts. So uh, that's another dream that that we're trying to to get. And uh, um, I, I've got a call into the National Science Foundation, and uh, I, we we've got some good friends and and great support there. So. Um, thank you very much. And with that being said, if there are are there any more questions or comments from from the interns? If not, I will call this uh, public presentation of the Public Policy Institute to an adjournment. It is five o'clock in the evening. How time flies! Sizuus Masi, Happy Labor Day! Please be safe. 
God bless each and every one of you. Si Jusun Benedici, Zen Sainamasi. We are adjourned. Thank you.